thanks for staying here. Uh, I'll be as, as brief as I can, at least this is my promise. And uh, the, the, the motivation uh, for this presentation comes from the, uh, from the moot court, the mock trial that we had uh, earlier today. Uh, and that was basically a case that presented the Omnicare and Orman in, in, in Israel. And the, <clears throat> the Omnicare court, citing Unitrin, says something like, deal protection, uh, protections made it mathematically impossible and realistically unattainable for any other proposal to succeed. So what I thought I should do or could do today is to do an Omnicaresque uh, exercise, but, but in reverse. So let's take a subject that is mathematically impossible and realistically unattainable under Delaware law, and let's try and see how would Israeli law handle it. Uh, the presentation is based on, on two papers, two related papers. One's called My Creditor's Keeper. The other one is Uneasy Diminishing, Tzimtzum Shelo Kifshuto, and some uh, additional work in progress uh, that I'm working on right now. So the common setting, the common wisdom about the vicinity or the zone of insolvency is, is pretty straightforward. It, it's really corporate finance for dummies, right? Uh, we have a financial or corporate setting that is blindingly uh, obvious. We have creditors with fixed claims, we have shareholders with uh, residual claims, and in the vicinity or in the zone of insolvency when the company is experiencing some, some financial distress, uh, theory tells us that shareholders or managers on behalf of shareholders would rationally, that is, go wild or bet the farm. That is, they will uh, dilute assets, they will engage in what we call tunneling, or they will dilute claims, they will take up more debt, increase the leverage of, of the company, or they would substitute assets uh, by moving into riskier projects, hoping to see, to get the upper tail, uh, because they are agnostic to the lower tail, which the, the, the risk that the creditors bear. But in, in response, I mean, creditors are not naive, right? Uh, they are rational. So in response, again, the theory and also uh, uh, practice tell, tell us uh, creditors, again, rationally would uh, price the risk. They will increase interest rate and they will use extensive covenants to hedge uh, that, that kind of risk. And this is, this is the story, right? This is the dominant theory in the literature. Uh, it also appears in the cases. Courts believe in this theory. Uh, which is somewhat peculiar because, uh, somewhat surprisingly, there's hardly, uh, hardly any evidence to back uh, this, this theory. But, but I, I fully concede, I'm not challenging this part of the theory, I think it's very convincing. However, it's only part of the story. So what I try to do in, in this project is to expand the theoretical framework uh, or the, the way we think about companies and managers and, and investors in the vicinity of, of insolvency by introducing a factor that's called uh, escalation of commitment. Now, escalation of commitment is, is, a very, is something very serious. Uh, it is an irrational factor that has been extensively studied in several fields, in management, in public policy, uh, and, and, and other fields. But um, again, somewhat surprisingly, it's been virtually overlooked in the, uh, in the legal literature. And I'm trying to make up for, for it at least in this particular context. So what is escalation of commitment in a nutshell? It describes a phenomenon in which uh, people, managers, people who manage projects uh, fail to acknowledge reality. I mean, they fail to act on new information. And uh, I mean, we see this quite often. People remain married to their original choices, right? They, even though everybody around them, around them uh, tells them, well, this is, no, this is not good for you anymore. You should abandon it. You should pull the plug. No, but keep, people continue uh, uh, to, to invest and actually increase, escalate the commitment to that, to that failing project. Now, it's, it's, a, it's not a simple uh, phenomenon. It's actually quite complex. It is affected by individual factor, mostly psychological, but also by uh, social factors, social norms, social expectations, social setting, and so on. Um, it is also quite ubiquitous. Uh, we observe, I mean, it's been widely documented in private projects, in business corporations, uh, uh, in, in public projects. We can think about a host of examples for escalation of commitment. Uh, escalation of commitment is also quite tenacious as well. It's very hard 
uh, the theory and the practice tell us to de-escalate. That's the reverse of escalation of commitment. Uh, if you want to su successfully de-escalate, um, there's, there's consensus now that you should engage in constant collection of new information and constant assessment of that new information, which is easier said than done. And to facilitate that, it is recommended that you, if you're the manager of a, of a project, that you, you should pretty much uh, change the makeup of the management team by introducing people who are not part of the earlier decisions, so they are not committed to the earlier decisions that are now uh, failing. And how is that relevant to our story? Uh, the argument that, I'm, that I make is that <clears throat> excuse me, escalation of commitment is a major factor in the zone of insolvency. This, is, this, is, this could be pretty much the dominant reason why management keep on managing the company the way they, they've been doing even though reality has already changed. And one could argue, I, I definitely believe that it's possibly more severe than the standard story, than opportunistic risk shifting. Uh, and, and therefore, legal policy should address it, at least in some way. Which leads us to the question, how do laws around the world, or at least in several jurisdictions, address the, the, the situation of the zone of insolvency or the, or the setting? Uh, and when we look around, we see quite diverse doctrinal approaches. So in Delaware, there is no zone, legally speaking, right? Uh, the seminal decision is Diwala, and then was implemented in Quadrant 1 and 2, and just to quote uh, Vice Chancellor Laster in Quadrant 2, there is no legally recognized zone of insolvency with implications for fiduciary duty claims. No zone, legally speaking. Obviously, there is a zone business-wise and finance-wise, but the law denies any implication for fiduciary duty claims. The situation in the UK, Australia, and New Zealand is quite different, and, and these jurisdic jurisdictions are interrelated. There is a lot of cost reference uh, among them and uh, mutual development. There is certainly some zone that is recognized in which there are certain legal implications for fiduciary duties. So well, there's a line of cases beginning with Kinsella in Australia, then with Mercia, and the most current one. Uh, is uh, BTI versus Sequana. So in BTI, the uh, Court of Appeals in, in the UK says the applicable, tr applicable trigger for the creditor interest fiduciary duty uh, is a real as opposed to a remote risk of insolvency. So it's, there's certainly the court recognizes the existence of a special fiduciary duty to take account of or to, to take creditor's interest into account. Uh, BTI is now under appeal before the UK Supreme Court, it was argued, uh, we are, I mean, those of you who are interested, uh, are, are awaiting the decision, so anything could happen, but that's the doctrine uh, right now. Which brings us to Israel. Uh, and in Israel, when you look at the cases, uh, there is a zone of insolvency with legal implications for fiduciary duties, but it's quite murky. So what you could see is mixed one could even say confused influences coming from UK law and, and US law. Uh, the, the kind of the fundamental layer, the baseline is uh, pretty established. I mean, this is, this is uh, nearly orthodox doctrine, uh, Adoram uh, Harari, uh, that perceives uh, solvency as, as a key component in the best interest of the company. Which means that and this, is, this has strong UK laws, strong English law influences, uh, that creditor interests could trump uh, shareholder interest in the sense that even the 100% uh, 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 of the shareholders cannot ratify a breach of fiduciary duty that threatens the solvency of, of the company. And this is duomatic in the in UK law. More recently, there's a line of cases, I'm here mentioning just two from the Supreme Court, Synergy Kvalim and Or City Nadlan, uh, in which the Supreme Court recognizes the existence, the legal, again, the legal existence of some zone of insolvency, and the court says quite openly that it's fuzzy. It's not entirely clear what goes on there, what are the implications, but there is a setting <clears throat> in which things happen, and these things call on corporate fiduciaries, on the directors, to take creditors' interest uh, into account. And most recently, that, that it took place just uh, a few uh, weeks ago uh, in the Better Place uh, decision. That was a leave, a leave to uh, amend a statement of claim 
uh, the Supreme Court remanded uh, back to, to the district court. Um, essentially, I, I, I could definitely say inviting the claimant to restate its claim uh, in a way that mentions or implements or relies on or leverages enhanced scrutiny in the zone of insolvency. There's nearly guidance given by the Supreme Court. You should mention that in your amended state, statement of claim. And Better Place leverages uh, Velnikov, which everybody here, uh, at least the Israeli uh, 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 people in the audience, are familiar with. Velnikov is the Supreme, uh, Israeli Supreme Court's attempt to, uh, I would say, import Unicom uh, into Israeli law uh, to implement uh, Delaware, openly Im implement a Delaware-inspired standard of review of uh, enhanced scrutiny in situations of uh, potential conflict. Uh, and, and the Supreme Court, the Israel Supreme Court in better place, says, well, you know, there's Vernikov and there's enhanced scrutiny uh, uh, under Vernikov. You might want to think about arguing uh, along those lines. <clears throat> so, what does it mean to de-escalate, uh, uh, to, to implement a duty to de-escalate in the zone of insolvency? Um, as I said, I believe that once a, legal, once a jurisdiction, once a legal system recognizes the, the, the zone, uh, it, do, it also recognizes that contract, contracts are not enough, that there's room for legal intervention beyond, beyond contract. That's the opposite of the Delaware approach that says there is no zone uh, uh, duty. And there's a lot to be said for the Delaware approach. So I'm not taking a stand in, in this project, uh, which one is better. I'm just looking at the diversity. Uh, the, there are certain advantages uh, to the Delaware's, uh, to Delaware's uh, uh, approach, as, at least as a second best, because it is very difficult to design uh, a legal regime of uh, duties in the zone of insolvency. So this would be a duty that says or calls on directors to love thy creditor, right? That, that's basically the, the, the idea. If one wants to give substantive content to such an uh, 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 you know, ambiguous idea, my argument is that this should be a duty to change business strategy. That is to say, once the duty to consider creditors is triggered in the zone of insolvency, in a system that recognizes uh, a legal, legally recognizes zone of insolvency, there should be, the duty means that changing from entrepreneurial strategy to custodial strategy which is to say that management should move from, should shift from uh, profit-oriented uh, management to essentially rescuing, trying to rescue and preserve key assets of the company with a view to restructure, rehabilitate, go, re return to profit-oriented uh, uh, management or go, go to bankruptcy. Ideally, there should also be uh, um, a change in management. If, if we take the literature on escalation of commitment uh, seriously. Right now in Israeli law, there's no basis to require a change in management, but um, again, in the comparative sources, New Zealand in particular, uh, courts acknowledge the fact that if you want to save a company, it should be a good idea, it could be a good idea to change the makeup of, of management team, which if you implement a duty along, along these lines would also mean that you should abandon business judgment uh, uh, rule uh, kind of review uh, because this is no longer the business oriented uh, duty of care but you shift to a duty of caution from trust law uh, in, uh, in, informed by, by trust law. So any judicial review of the board's performance in the vicinity of, of insolvency would shift from process focused or process oriented kind of review to a review of substantive reasonableness of the steps taken by, by the board because that's the content of the duty of caution uh, in, in trust law and also, uh, uh, I would argue, in the vicinity of insolvency. What do we make of enhanced scrutiny here? What role does enhanced scrutiny have to play here? Uh, none, I would argue. Enhanced scrutiny Unical uh, type enhanced scrutiny has no role uh, in this setting. There is no potential conflict. I mean, there are, there's financial distress, there are strategic management issues, but uh, there's no question about the integrity of, uh, of the board. So implementing enhanced scrutiny kind of thinking is flawed 
in, in my humble opinion, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm more radical. I think that enhanced scrutiny in Israeli law is foreign to Israeli law uh, uh, more generally, but now that the Supreme Court has adopted it, that's part of you know, the, the law of the land. In any event, uh, in the context of the uh, zone of insolvency, has nothing to do, because Delaware, as, as we just saw, uh, denies the existence of legal, uh, uh, implica any legal implications for the zone, so there's no point in, in, in implementing uh, enhanced scrutiny. Um, I will close by just mentioning that even if one rejected, you know, if you believed me and you thought that, well, enhanced scrutiny, unical type enhanced scrutiny has nothing to do in the context of, of uh, the vicinity of insolvency, still both doctrines, a duty of caution kind of doctrine and some, some better place Velnikov enhanced scrutiny kind of thing, uh, would lead to the same, same outcome, same, same judicial treatment of directors' uh, 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 management because both look for uh, doing some substantive reasonableness uh, review of the board's conduct. And that's it. Thank you.